an official war artist in both world wars, Spencer was one of the first painters to be captured on film. Stanley Spencer has always had a special connection with the Tate Gallery here in London. His best known work, The Resurrection Cookham, was bought for a thousand pounds by the gallery in the 1920s and has remained one of the most popular paintings in the collection. Later this month, Tate Britain will be presenting the largest exhibition of his work for 20 years. With previously unseen home movie footage and recollections for the first time from both his daughters and the friends and neighbours whom he painted, Omnibus resurrects the reputation of this very English artist. Stanley Spencer brought the Christian story right to the heart of his beloved home of Cookham, on the banks of the River Thames. He set the resurrection in the churchyard and peopled it with his friends and neighbours from the village. I think it was the feeling of the bodies in the churchyard that led him on to the thinking about resurrection. He seemed to have an obsession on resurrections and when he painted these pictures he always chose Cookham as the basis of them all. It was with this work, The Resurrection Cookham, that Stanley made his name. His interest in the resurrection seems to have started when he was very young. And um, there's a letter here that he wrote to Gwen Ravara, who was a very great friend of his at the Slade. And what he says is, I rose from the dead last night. It happened like this. I was walking about in the churchyard when I suddenly flopped down among the grave mounds. I wedged myself tightly between these mounds, feet to the east, and died. I rose from the dead soon afterwards because of the wet grass, but I did it in a very stately manner. I have nothing more to tell you just now, more later on, your loving Stanley. <laughs> A holy suburb of heaven was how Stanley described the quiet Thameside village of Cookham, where he was born in 1891. Cookham is a kind of newspaper to me, through the pages of which I'm anxiously glancing in the hope of finding something about myself in it. Uh, on the whole, it's uh, rather satisfactory. I seem to find here and there bits, and uh, in sort of writing up very well. But you understand what I mean, that I find something of myself all over the place. Everything he loved in life was in Cookham. He loved the people, and he loved the surroundings. He just loved Cookham. He never seemed to wear a hat at all, and uh, his hair was usually standing on end and all that sort of thing. He, he wasn't all that partially dressed, but it looks like he might have just got out of bed, you know. <laughs> Stanley entered the prestigious Slade School of Art in London in 1908. He was in a generation of brilliant students, including Paul Nash, David Bomberg, and Mark Gertler. They were to change the course of British painting. He remained, however, resolutely the day boy returning religiously on the 508 train from Paddington, and as a result, he gained the nickname Cookham from his fellow students. Stanley set most of his early biblical works in Cookham, as he declared, in a way, all the things that happened at Cookham happened in the Bible. The nativity is, in a sense, rather like a nativity of his work. It's a strange picture. I love it, but it is a strange picture. The Madonna, she is a formidable character, and I think my father described her as monumental and sort of part of nature. And uh, Joseph is rather um, on the periphery. And there are the couples 
um, apparently they were originally going to be wise men, but um, they'd found a new wisdom and uh, are rejoicing in happy relationships. The baby is only regarded by one of the wise men, and that is how Christ is in the world very often, hardly regarded. Stanley also painted views of local activities, such as mending cows, and the annual marking of young swans on the River Thames, swan upping. When I was in Cookham Church on Sunday morning, I could hear the people going on the river from where I was sitting, and uh, I could imagine what it was all like. I could hear the oars going into the ronocks, and I thought about the swan upping that I had seen, and when I came out, I wanted to do a draw drawing of the whole imagined scene, and I did it, and I called it swan upping. Uh, I did the drawing in my cottage. I particularly didn't look at the actual scene. I wanted to do the whole thing from imagination. But Stanley was going to have to wait another four years before he was able to finish swan upping. With the outbreak of the First World War, Stanley enlisted in the Royal Medical Corps. He was first sent to the Beaufort War Hospital in Bristol, before volunteering for service overseas. In August 1916, he was sent to Macedonia. He must have seemed an eccentric, and there are stories of him being sort of wandering off and being caught in the wrong place and sort of bawled at and shouted at. And, you know, I mean, how many soldiers were going through that campaign standing, walking along behind mules, carrying a tin of, you know, dried biscuits and thinking of God and, and transfiguration? I don't know, maybe lots were, but Spencer certainly was. A year after arriving in Macedonia, and after a bout of malaria, Stanley joined a fighting unit with the 7th Battalion of the Royal Berkshires and was sent to the front. We know several things about Spencer's war. I mean, we know that he had seen extreme brutality and suffering, even though people talked about Macedonia as a non-event. I mean, there was violence there. Obviously, there was a lot of fighting there. And we also know that he was directly affected. I mean, he lost his brother, Sidney, the brother with whom he was most closely associated, in a way. After the armistice, Stanley returned to Cookham, but he found it difficult to settle. He had a row with his father, and w with that he packed his bags and he moved across the river to live with Lord Slessor. And Lord Slessor, I don't think Lord Slessor really meant him to live with them, but he often used to drop in on people and stay for tea and supper and half the night, you know. So. He, he stayed with Lord Cesar, and in that year, he did about 12 paintings, one of which was The Last Supper, and that, of course, caused a lot of controversy. All those feet, crossed over feet in, the, in it, you see, and people wonder what on earth he was getting at. The Last Supper, set in a cook and malt house, was one of a series of paintings intended to reaffirm his faith in Cookham as the new Jerusalem. Stanley began spending more time away from Cookham. He joined a circle of artists and intellectuals in Hampstead, where he met the painter Hilda Carline. Well, he loved her, he did. He thought she was a, an amazing woman, mysterious and extraordinary. You know, she was a very deep person, but she was also delightful. You know, she had a, de a delightful sense of humor and she was amused for daddy. Stanley and Hilda were married in 1925 and their first daughter, Shirin, was born later that year. The resurrection in Cookham Churchyard, described by the Times as the most important picture painted by any English artist in the present century was meant as a celebration of their relationship. 
he needed to integrate the different parts of his life. He wanted to bring these new family members, the Carlines, his wife, his brother-in-law, the people he'd met and with whom he was now spending a great deal of time in London as well as Cookham, he had to bring them to Cookham. And the resurrection provided the ideal vehicle. Uh, but it's all there with Spencer in control of the whole scene. You see, everything has a sort of double meaning for me. There's the ordinary everyday meaning of things, utilitarian meaning, and the imaginary meaning about it all. And uh, as I was saying, I wanted to bring these things together. And in this big, first big resurrection picture of mine, uh, one has really rather a good example of that kind of thing. I think I'll try and do a, a sort of personally conducted tour through the picture and you will probably see what I mean. This is Cookham Church, more or less, and uh, the river runs behind it. Uh, down below, you see people reading their own tombstones, which must be rather wonderful to do. And uh, nobody's in any hurry. Those men lying on the top of the stones I liked very much because it gave me the feeling that the resurrection was a peaceful occasion and I'm very fond of peace and I like the happiness. That's the main idea of this picture. When out here, you have people being uh, more or less tidied up. One man is being brushed down by his wife. Well, I was thinking of my father and my mother brush brushing him down before he went to London. All the things which make for joyful life are celebrated. And of course, his, his whole life with Hilda, which involves all his, all his sexual feelings about her, all his spiritual feelings about her, they're all celebrated there. Even the woman smelling the flower, she's, she's really curious about it. She's, she's feeling how momentous this occasion is. So therefore, she's pushing it against her face which I think is rather expressive. Um, now here, for example, along here, you have um, what I call that is like the sort of resurrection of thought. They're sort of prophets or something of that kind, and you notice they're all in different positions of thinking. For instance, that is very much the position of thought. I mean, if you go like that, you're thinking about something, and so on. Uh, this theme I'm rather keen about. I think I was thinking of some very grand man. I don't really like flowers, but I like him very much, and I couldn't help putting nice flowers. Here is a sort of, almost like a sort of my own signature. It's meant to be me reclining there, in between those tombs like that. And I was thinking of a book, that if you look into a book, you, you feel when you settle down to read, the book becomes a sort of associated in your mind with a peaceful state. And so that figure put between that further emphasizes, to me, this peaceful feeling. I think that's all I can think about at the moment. If the Cookham resurrection consolidated Stanley's feelings for his beloved village and his new wife, his next project allowed him to come, belatedly, to some understanding of his wartime experiences. He was commissioned by Louis and Mary Berend to decorate the Sander Memorial Chapel in the Hampshire village of Berkeley. The chapel was specially built to Stanley's specifications and he was given complete freedom to create a visual and spiritual autobiography of his war experience. Stanley's response to the commission was, what ho, jot ho? The pictures in this chapel really divide into two major experiences that I had in the 1914 war. One was Macedonia scene and the other was, was Bristol hospital scene. Spencer wanted to create a very different kind of war memorial, one that celebrated the disregarded moments of the war experience. The chapel was inspired by early Renaissance fresco cycles, 
The side walls show moments in Stanley's war as though in a strip cartoon, while the end wall depicts once again the resurrection. You can read the story of Spencer's engagement with the war. The first picture in this sequence is called Convoy Arriving with Wounded, and it shows this bus full of wounded people with their arms in slings and things coming towards the gates of the Beaufort War Hospital. And the man who's opening them is an absolute terror. He's somebody that Spencer remembered as, as a completely frightening figure. He described his eyes as beefy. He does all sorts of things. He bosses people around and he has the job of cutting up the corpses in autopsies. So he's an emblem of this new institutionalized, brutalizing experience that Spencer himself remembers arriving at after he left Cookham. The picture called Making Beds shows a room in a house in Salonica that had been turned into a hospital. And it's actually Spencer's own bed because it was in this room that he was recovering from malaria. The first thing you have to say about it is that it's got this marvellous hot water bottle in it with a foot on it. Now, somehow I'm sure that British art can never be the same again after that hot water bottle is inserted into a memorial chapel. But if you look behind the bed as well, you get this incredible array of bits and pieces, me memorabilia, fragments of a life pinned on a wall. There's certainly Hilda Carline is there. Now, that's interesting partly because Spencer was married and living with Hilda Carline in Berkeley when he was doing these paintings, but he didn't know her when he was in Macedonia. So there's this rather nice, playful projection of the present back into the past. Dugout is, um, in a sense, one of the culminating pictures of, of this whole series. It portrays a group of men coming out of the dugout on the day when peace is announced. They're emerging into the world to hear that the war is over, and so they're looking around in perplexity, amazement. Some of them even look slightly fearful, you know, I mean, as, if, as if they don't know what's going on. So this is a rather wonderful moment of release. When I did this resurrection, I wanted it to be in Macedonia. I wanted it to be in a particular place that I remembered. And uh, I felt that everything could be, so to speak, celebrated there. Spencer, who's always odd, he's always particular, he's always slightly peculiar. But here I think his peculiarity is really useful in our time because it works to remind us that this war was not the same as our myths of it. The man rolling up his putty is a memory I had when I found I'd been through some barbed wire and I think that the barbed wire must have cut the putty through anyway. I found it trained along the ground. So I just picked up the putty and rolled it up. Well, now that's a moment of peace. That roll in the putty is a moment for me to reflect and think, and really those moments of peace where the real positive, final and eternal moment of this man. And when it gets to the man above those who's reclining over a crucifix, he's got a little crucifix there, and I get a feeling he's there forever. I don't think anything, any bomb or anything dropping behind his head will make him take the least notice. Immediately above him, you see Christ as just a man among the men receiving them, receiving the crosses and quietly talking to them. What Stanley is doing is looking at the world in front of his eyes and trying to see the possibility of redemption and transfiguration in it. But the world comes first. You know, the mules come before God in this work, I think. In 1932, Stanley returned triumphant to Cookham, now aged 40, financially secure, and newly elected as an associate of the Royal Academy. He bought a large house in the village. His second daughter, Unity, had been born in 1930, but cracks began to appear in his marriage, with Hilda spending more and more time away from Cookham. She wasn't that keen on Cookham. You know, she'd been living in Hampstead and Oxford, and she was clever and intellectual. And I think she needed some stimulus that you could get in, in the city. She liked the countryside, but, you know, I think she needed the stimulus of the city. And I think a village life was a, perhaps a bit boring for her, maybe. Stanley began spending more time with a woman who shared his fascination for Cookham and claimed to be an artist, Patricia Priest. In the early days, um, Mummy had no reason to dislike Patricia or be suspicious of her or anything. 
she and Daddy both painted Patricia's portrait. Although the portrait is a very um, powerful portrait, I don't know what stage the relationship with Daddy was when that portrait was painted. But Mummy would believe in people as best she could, you know, until disaster struck, and then I think it was just too much for her where Patricia was concerned. Though Stanley was aware that Patricia was living with a long-term companion, Dorothy Hepworth, his infatuation was undiminished. He seemed fascinated by her, and I understand that I did see one of the necklaces which he bought for her, the most exquisite amethyst necklace interspersed with small diamonds and clothes. I believe she wore clothes very well, being tall and elegant. Stanley wanted Patricia, but he also still wanted Hilda and proposed a relationship which involved both women. These feelings also fed into his art with one of his most arresting paintings to date, Love Among the Nations, which Stanley attributed to his war experience. He wrote, During the war, when I contemplated the horror of my life and the lives of those with me, I felt that the only way to end the ghastly experience would be if everyone suddenly decided to indulge in every degree and form of sexual love, carnal love, bestiality, anything you like to call it. These are the joyful inheritances of mankind. That, of course, is written with biblical overtones. I, I also can't help feeling that Love Among Nations is painted with a certain sense of humor. The Spencer figure, and there's more than one of them, is there, uh, in one case, being fondled by uh, a couple of sort of African-like figures, which one can only describe as caricatures. I mean, parche political correctness, this is somebody in the 1920s, 1930s, taking almost a picture book view of, of another civilization, of another culture from his own. But then he appears again, uh, fair-haired as opposed to dark-haired, standing, again being sort of fondled by one of those uh, rather huge and sort of bosomly and ample figures of a woman. It's interesting, he was quite shy and private about his inner life world and so on. But he was also very open, so people were surprised to find that there wasn't a private standing, you know. And, um, and he lived, I mean, he was a virgin until he married my mother when he was 34. But at the same time, he was a normal, healthy man, and I think, therefore, he expressed a lot of his feelings about these matters in his paintings, but it wasn't just about sexuality, it was about bringing different aspects of love together and to sort of find a whole meaning and redemption in it. You know, spiritual God, the lot, he wants it all together, the whole thing together. <laughs> Sex, love, God and everything. Stanley's desire to love everybody proved impractical. In May 1937, Hilda had had enough of his obsession with Patricia and decided reluctantly to divorce him. A few days later, Stanley married Patricia Priest. Patricia and Stanley were married at Maidenhead Registry Office, but then I can recall of seeing them were, uh, with Dorothy Hepworth, Patricia's friend, uh, the three of them walking up and down the, the causeway at Cookham, uh, just talking, and then the two women went off to St Ives and Stanley went back to his own house. And they never lived together after that, you see. Very odd. Stanley's marriage to Patricia was never consummated. Although I think he did know that they were a lesbian couple, I don't think he understood just how complicated their masquerade was. Stanley never knew that Patricia didn't paint the pictures that were signed Patricia Priest. They were painted by her long-term lover, Dorothy Hepworth. She was a fraud through and through. She was a con woman, basically. I was told that a picture of me was on view in London, signed by Patricia Priest, but I said I don't pose for Miss Priest. I, I pose for Dorothy Hepworth. He treated her as if she was a very fragile, rare object. I thought she was a very dislikable 
disagreeable, bad-mannered woman, and very, very surly. In nude self-portraits of this period, Stanley confronted his obsession with Patricia. With Patricia, I don't know what it was. The word curiosity comes to mind, or observation. Perhaps he was trying to come to terms with this woman, who, who he found so difficult. I mean, she flattered him, but she also tormented him. Maybe it was his way of trying to love her, because he didn't like not loving things. He did want to make things lovable, and so he painted them in order to love them. One of the few things he actually said about these pictures was that he liked to imagine himself as an ant crawling over the surface of the flesh. That isn't a typical lover's remark, if I may say so, but it's very revealing of a painter who is tackling the very interesting problem here of getting a little bit too close to his subject for comfort. Stanley saw his nude paintings of Patricia as an integral part of his visual autobiography. He conceived of a grandiose scheme in which different aspects of his life would be exhibited in a specially constructed church, which he called the Church of Me. He based the plan of the imagined church on the layout of Cookham. There was the High Street, and all the different things happening in it, that would have been the nave of the church. Then there was the river running behind the street, which would have been one of the aisles of the church, and the back lane running the other side. Well, that all made the sort of shape of a church, which appealed to me very much. Although the church of me would never be built, Stanley continued to paint pictures for it for the rest of his life. In the meantime, in order to support Patricia, Hilda, and his two children, he was forced to produce paintings that had a ready market. In 1938, he painted some 40 landscapes. He was in the middle of the road, and he was painting somebody's front garden. And I said to him, Stanley, this isn't really what you want to do, is it, you see? And he stopped, and he looked at me. And he said, well, you see, my dear, he said, this kind of thing keeps the wolf from the door. It's what I call a pot boiler. In 1938, Patricia evicted Stanley from his house in Cookham, which he had made over to her some time before, and he moved to rented rooms in London. He began work on a series of paintings of Christ in the wilderness. But Stanley was not alone for long. Daphne was a rather Amazonian woman. Her portrait is in the Tate. And she used to come and regularly stay with Stanley. And he used to ring my mother and say, please, can Daphne stay with you? I can't get on with my work when Daphne's staying. She chased him high and low, and she had a perfectly good husband, head of the Slade at the time. Yes, she used to come and hide in our dining room to hope that Stanley would come round. <laughs> Large feet and was like Du Maurier's trilby. Yes, and, yeah, a, and a healthy appetite in the local cafe. Ate like I don't know what. Very, she's a very attractive very woman. Very good looking, very handsome. Because she's good little... looking husband with a pork pie hat, but she fancied little Stanley. So they say that she picked him up. She yeah. probably did. You know, physically. Probably. Daphne was to remain a friend of Stanley's for the rest of his life. With the outbreak of the Second World War, Stanley's art was given a new lease of life. Stanley Spencer is one of the artists commissioned by the Ministry of Information to undertake a series of paintings showing aspects of Britain at war. Spencer's job is to record the contribution made by the Glasgow shipyards to the war effort. He was like a little bird in the shipyard. There wasn't anywhere that he didn't try to get onto. He got on top of the building, ship building, very dangerous position, on top of the crane, and his figure was so uh, uh, personal, you could recognize him where he was. And then he would go out in the breakwater, and 
sketch the ships passing, and Stanley was so worshipped by the workers. He made little sketches on a tiny roll of toilet paper. And I said, why do you do that? Oh, well, he said, it's cheap, and I can go on. It's like an Egyptian papyrus. I just go on and do sketch after sketch after sketch. An artist like Spencer couldn't fail to respond to all of these fiery furnaces and human figures writhing and contorted within these mechanized forms. It uh, brought out the best in him as an artist. It fired his imagination and it enabled him to, over a very short period of about two years, to produce an absolutely incredible body of work using extraordinary angles, capturing this kind of uh, uh, Vulcan's forge aspect of the uh, shipyards and the manufacture of ships. What Spencer recognized straight away was the sense of community. If this place was a microcosm, then of course it was just as susceptible as Cookham for the kind of compliment that Spencer wanted to pay it. Stanley described how one night, disturbed by the noise of a jazz band, he took a walk above Port Glasgow, looked down onto the cemetery and saw his next grand project. Yet another resurrection. Now if you'll come for a little walk with me alongside of this picture, I take you to where you see the girl getting out of the grave meeting her sailor husband. In the foreground, I put a sort of angel who wipes tears from an old man's eyes. To the right, a man standing on an open grave bends forward so that a girl can climb out off his back. Another girl standing in the same grave hands out a baby to a woman who bends down to take it, and other babies are also being lifted out. He's there in the Tate picture, not once, but personally, I think, several times. Uh, there's that very intimate detail, isn't there, of him uh, uh, embracing the figure of a woman against the profile of a gravestone. This is, in many ways, one of his archetypal images, love in the churchyard. In the center, there is a table tomb, and gathered round the upper end are men and women who are in a kind of ecstasy as they read the references to themselves on the lid. Below these, sharing their parents' happiness, are two children scrabbling about, looking at the carving or whatever is on the surface of this tomb. At the bottom, an old couple who are grandparents have crawled from their graves towards each other. They are full of happiness and wonder to see each other. They come from two worlds left and right of the picture. It's interesting what he says about the old couple, isn't it? You know, they come from two different worlds, not necessarily a male world and a female world, but they've had a long life together and they're delighted to see each other. And maybe he wishes he'd had a long life with mummy instead of things going wrong. And he took on board the fact that he had quite a big part to play in things going wrong between them. And therefore maybe that couple is a wishing of him and mummy to be in that state of having been together for a long time. After prolonged physical and mental illness, Hilda died in 1950. In spite of all the difficult times she had been through with Stanley, Hilda retained a deep affection for him, as she made clear in a letter written shortly before she died. Being with Stanley is like being with a holy person to one who perceives. 
It isn't that he is consciously good or bad, or intentionally anything, for he is the thing that so many strive for, and he only has to be, and a sermon is preached. Stanley's home seems to be the whole world. I think that's, I think that's extraordinary observation on the part of my mother. Um, and uh, when I first heard it, I was, I don't know, I was just amazed. Shortly after Hilda's death, Stanley broke off all contact with Patricia. This is an art class in a little village school. It's a rather special day because a real artist lives in the village and today he's come to join the class. One of the things that interests me is Spencer's reputation during the 1950s, where I think one can describe him as enjoying a certain amount of popularity. The BBC makes films about him. There is a tendency for journalists to go and photograph him in the churchyard. He becomes a local celebrity. And uh, a lot of people find these uh, uh, pictures rather reassuring in a way because after all, it is a very benign view of, uh, of, uh, of divine uh, judgment, but I've always thought that the late crucifixion stands in contrast to most of this work. It's a much more difficult picture. It deliberately brutalizes the whole business of the crucifixion. Stanley by then was old. He obviously couldn't go on painting for much longer. I went over to pick him up and he was working in his studio and it couldn't be interrupted so I went through a sort of filing cabinet he had, sort of drawers, in which were endless drawings on almost like greaseproof paper. And there was one there of a crucifixion. And I took this drawing of a crucifixion back with me and said to my father that somebody, somebody, had to commission this painting very quickly. Um, I'm delighted to say that my father did. He commissioned it for a brewer's school. The people in the picture of crucifying Christ are all wearing little red noddy caps. And uh, this is a direct reference to Alderham as a, as a brewer's school. And Christ is being crucified by brewers. There are faces looking out, and they are all portraits of people in Cookham. And I'm just there looking at it. Uh, and he come and dug me in the ribs, and I looked around, and the stand, he was quite much shorter than me. And, uh, and I looked at him, and he said, I've got you in at last. I said, what do you mean, got me in at last? He said, well, that's you. I said, where? He said, well, that's you with a hammer in your hand, with nails in your mouth, and you were driving the nails in the cross. And, and it didn't sink in for three or four days later. And he said, oh, Stanley said, I'm in that ruddy picture. <laughs> that's, and that's the way he was with, with people. I think there's quite a lot of the personal anger in that picture, which goes with the frustration that he was feeling as a serious artist. It's one thing to be loved as an eccentric painter who goes out with an old pram and a box of paints on a, to, to paint in the local churchyard, it's another to feel that some of the tasks you've set yourself are tasks which you may not live to finish. Ill with cancer and increasingly in pain, Stanley knew he was unlikely to complete a vast project portraying Christ at Cookham Regatta. But he took some consolation in the knighthood he received in 1959 from the Queen Mother. I hear that he took his shopping bag and he did. to receive his note with a pint of milk in it, oh. so that he could have a cup of tea when he got home. Oh, I see. Yes. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> and he also did a, a picture of 
two he roses. She did the two roses. Which she took up. For the Queen Mother. For the Queen Mother, and she rejected well, it. Well, no, she didn't, but they didn't allow presents for royalty. And when she heard she was a collector of the modern Sickert, etc., she was really upset because she would have had a free Spencer, a little portrait. Yeah, but she did, uh, so I understand, she rang up the next day yeah. and said, I've made a mistake, could I have a picture? Did she? Didn't get it, though. No, because he'd already given yeah, it given to the it cafe to the in cafe. the house, house street. To this day, it's called the Two Roses. Yes. One of Stanley's final paintings was a typically honest self-portrait. I find the last self-portrait very moving. There's something battered about it. He's been through a great deal. He must have been conscious of the contrast to the wide-eyed, innocent young man looking out from 1913. And here he is, he's seen it all in a way, but he's still absolutely glittering eyed. I mean, he's challenging us with mortality. He knew he was dying. He'd already had a failed operation for cancer, so he was, I think he knew he only had a few months to live. The last day of his life was quite amazing. He was part of the time with us and part of the time not. And part of the time that he was not with us, he was drawing. He was drawing in the air. And uh, I don't know. I don't know whether this was a sort of hallucination caused by drugs, or whether God was using this sort of hallucinatory feeling to give him this comfort, whether he was actually seeing something in heaven. I don't know. But it was... It was wonderful, and I wasn't surprised that he died at night. Hmm. Stanley died on the 14th of December, 1959. Four days later, his ashes were brought to Cookham Churchyard where they were laid to rest to the side of the path. A small marble plaque marks the spot. For more on Stanley Spencer, go to www.bbc.co.uk forward slash Tate. Next week, Omnibus celebrates My Fair Lady as Martin McCutcheon prepares to take on the magical role of Eliza Doolittle in the Royal National Theatre's new production in London. How a literary classic was reborn as a Hollywood musical and a story of class struggle turned into a fairy tale of elegance and beauty.